all joking and kidding aside, we want to turn to the word of the Lord this morning. Um, I believe he's given us, uh, given me a message for us this morning. And we're going to be looking in the book of Acts. We were looking there last week as well. But as we turn to the word of the Lord, would you join me? Let's just take a moment just to just to pray. And uh, we've talked about a lot of other things. We've talked about pigs. We've talked about not cubicles, whatever they're called. Capsules, capsules and things like that. But God has something much better for us this morning. And it's the word of the Lord. It's the living word of the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you do that, uh, if you check your phones just a minute if you need to, and just make sure your, your, the sound is off on your phones, and then we'll, we'll turn our hearts to the word of the Lord. Lord, we come to you this morning, and God, we, we, Lord, we're so thankful that when we gather together, we can have a good time together, and that we can enjoy one another's company, Lord, and we can relax and enjoy your presence as well. And Lord, as we turn to your word this morning, I pray that you'd give us ears to hear, hearts to respond, eyes to see the new things and the good things in your word. Lord, speak to us today, we pray. Make a difference in our lives. As Stephen said earlier, Lord, we don't want to waste time. We don't want to waste time. We want to grab the time and the opportunities that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Here we have this book. It's full of doctrine. It's full of teaching. It's full of poetry. It's full of stories. But this book is also full of people, really interesting people. Some of them bad, bad people. Some of them very good. And most people, a mixture in between. Real people, every single person, every single person we read about in this book is a real person. And some of them we will meet in heaven one day. We really will. You know, one day you're going to get to heaven. I'm going to be there, aren't you? Yes. yes. You're going to meet Moses. You're going to meet Aaron. You're going to meet Adam and Eve. You're going to meet Joseph. You're going to meet Elijah. You're going to meet Rahab. You, you say, but that's Old Testament. The Bible says she did, she worked righteous. She did righteous deeds. We'll meet Rahab. You'll meet Ruth. You'll meet her much older husband, Boaz. <laughs> and we'll meet many, many people like this. And this morning, we're, we're going to do, to do a character study. We don't do this very often. And I want to introduce you to someone that you already know about. It's a New Testament character, and you probably know him quite well. His name is Joseph. However, I don't want to talk about Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. Instead, we're going to talk about Joseph from Cyprus. Does anyone know who I'm talking about right now? He's Joseph from Cyprus, and we meet him in the book of Acts in chapter 4. And we know him by his nickname, not by his name Joseph, but by his nickname. What was his nickname? Barnabas. This morning, we want to talk about Barnabas. You know what? You all know him so well as Barnabas, some of you didn't even really remember his name is Joseph, right? His name is Joseph. That's right. And we're going to talk about Barnabas this morning. If The encourager. That's right. We're going to talk about Barnabas, the son of encouragement, this morning. If he were around today, who knows? We might call him Barney. <laughs> We might, you know, of course, that, of course, that brings up terrible images of a purple dinosaur, right? And, and that's not necessarily a positive image. Some of you are looking at me like, huh? And that means you have never had small children in the last 15 years or so, okay? But for those of us that have or have been around, we know Barney the purple dinosaur very well. Perhaps we would have called him Barney. But we're going to look at Barnabas this morning. And we, I want to take some time. We're going to get to know him a little bit better because Barnabas is someone that we can all be like. You know, we, we look at the Bible and there are people that we really admire so very much, right? If I were to ask you who you really, you look at the Bible and you just admire them, you really look up to them so much, 
who are some of the people you would say? I know who my dad would say. My dad would immediately say, Paul, that's right. B says Paul, that's right. Paul. What about some of the rest of you? David, David right? David, because of his heart for God. Okay, David, that's many of us. Somebody else? Peter, oh yeah, you know, if you asked me, I'd say Peter, or Joshua, right? Or perhaps Caleb uh, of the Old Testament. Abraham. Jehoshaphat, okay? And we look at some of these people, and if I asked you more, we, some of you would, would probably mention others as well, and you think about, I like them because of this or this character. You know, there are some people that we look at in the Bible, and we admire them and we, we respect them so much, but for some, their gifts and their calling and their ministry seem so up there, it seems like, well, I could never be like that. I can just kind of stand back and look and admire. But we look at Barnabas this morning. What I want to tell you this morning, what I want us to see this morning as we look at Barnabas, here is someone who was instrumental in the new church. Here is someone, as we're going to see, who really helped to make Paul who he was. I think without Barnabas, there probably would not have been the ministry of Paul that we know of. And yet, Barnabas was very down to earth and there are qualities and characters of Barnabas, characteristics of Barnabas, that every one of us could have and should have. So we're going to look at Barnabas this morning. Let's begin in Acts chapter 4. Barnabas is mentioned about 30 times in the New Testament. 30 times. And yet there are a lot of things he's not considered normally. He's not considered one of the main characters. The main character of, of Acts, if we think about it, we think about Paul, or we think about Peter, don't we? We think of these two really as the, as the, main, as the main characters. And yet we're going to look at Barnabas this morning, and we find him in Acts 4, and we're going to read a little bit more about it because we need a little bit of context. You know, when we talk about Bible study, I always say, look at the context, look at the context. This will help you in your Bible study. So let's see what's going on as we meet Barnabas. In verse 32, we read, all the believers were united in heart and mind. Now, if we had time this morning, I would say, what happened before verse 32? They're all united in heart and mind. There must be something else going on. So on your own, I encourage you to do that. But we read that the church, in the church, it was a special time. They were united in heart and mind. Look at this next sentence. I was so struck by this as I was studying yesterday. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. Do you feel that way? That what you own is not your own? I'll be really honest with you, as I was last week. Sometimes I feel that way and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm a little bit possessive about, but that's mine. I worked hard for that. But we have this beautiful picture of harmony and unity and the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. And he says, and it says that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. And when you and I have that heart, what I own, it's not my own. We will share it. We'll be willing to share everything we have rather than holding on to it. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. So here we have this beautiful picture. The apostles, but not just the apostles who are at the top. You also have here just the people in the church, the people that were gathered in the church. There's this wonderful harmony and unity. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. So we have this beautiful picture of possessions meeting a need very, very easily. Nobody being forced to, nobody being asked to, nobody being told to, no guilt trip, you've got more and they don't have enough, you should give, which we often hear, don't we, in the word of, it, when we often see in the world today, don't we, in churches today, there's such a strong pressure, you should do this, you should do this, but there's the, the heart 
that's being touched by the Holy Spirit and as the heart is touched by the Holy Spirit, there's a free giving so that those in need have enough and those that have plenty have the joy of sharing. And then we see in verse 36, for instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned, and he brought the money to the apostles. So here we have, it's a new time, and there are many people who are giving, but they point out specifically Joseph. Just a short time earlier, the Holy Spirit had been poured out, the Holy Spirit had been given, on the, and he was on the day of Pentecost, just as Jesus promised he would be, and Jews from around Asia and Europe had been gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, and they had witnessed this miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where there were tongues of fire, and people spoke in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them. It wasn't man. It wasn't a person saying, say these words. It was the Holy Spirit. The Bible makes that very, very clear. The work of the Holy Spirit always. It's not the work of man. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And all of these Jews that were gathered from all over Europe and Asia were there at the time. And on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 heard, believed, repented, were baptized in water and were baptized with the Holy Spirit and were added to the church. And then from then on, it kept on happening and it kept on happening as more and more people believed. A short time after that, 2,000 more when Peter and John healed the lame man. Um, excuse me, just a minute. Sorry, may, can, can, sorry to interrupt just a minute. It's a, can you maybe turn a little bit or whatever? It's a little bit loud. Sorry. Maybe turn, maybe turn just a little bit or something like that. I think it's, it's, it's a little bit loud for people. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay back to the message. Okay? Okay. When did Barnabas join the church? We don't know, but it's very possible that Barnabas believed and joined the church on the day of Pentecost. It's not very clear to us. The Bible doesn't say, but it's very, very possible that because he was from Cyprus, he was in Jerusalem, he was from the tribe of Levi, and he too may have heard and seen what happened on the day of Pentecost, and he may have believed. So it's possible. So the Holy Spirit is working in people's lives. God's great blessing is on them. They're united in heart and mind. There's no division. There's no bickering. There's no jealousy. There's no prejudice. There's no, I'm like this this and you're like this. They are of one heart and they're of one mind. And this is a special time. And it's in this circumstance and in this situation that we meet Barnabas, that we meet Joseph, who's nicknamed Barnabas. He's called the son of encouragement. Now I want us to see something as we look at this. He's not the only one that's selling land and selling houses. There are others who are doing it as well. If you go forward to chapter 5, what happens in chapter 5? Ananias and Sapphira, right? The two who also sold land, but they deceived the Holy Spirit and they were struck dead by the Lord. So that's going on as well. So even in the early church, there were issues like that, but the Lord took care of it. And we see Barnabas. He is singled out and he's nicknamed the son of encouragement. Now, why is Barnabas singled out when nobody else is? Many people were generous and many people were giving. There was something special about him. And we see Barnabas. He's given the nickname. He's given this nickname, and it means son of encouragement. And we'll talk about his name a little bit more, just a, just a little bit later. And then what happens to Barnabas? Chapter 4, we meet him. And then for five chapters, Barnabas disappears. Disappears. Why even talk about Barnabas in chapter 4 if he's going to disappear for five chapters? What happens in those five chapters? Well, in those five chapters, the church continues to grow. Seven men, including Stephen, are called by the Holy Spirit and become the deacons of the church. Is Barnabas one of the deacons? Yes or no? No. Barnabas is not one of the deacons. Now, you know, if he's mentioned in chapter 4, I would think, well, maybe he should be a deacon. 
but his gifts were not in that area. He had other gifts. And the Bible makes it very clear. He has given gifts to each one of us. All of us have been given gifts. And some of you this morning are saying, but I don't really have a gift. If you are born again, and you are in the, fa if you're born again, you're in the family of God, whether you feel like it or not, whether you exercise it or not, whether you do anything with it or not, the Holy Spirit has given you at least, at least one gift. And that gift is to build up the body of Christ in some way, in some particular way, in a way that you can, that nobody else can. And so we see Barnabas. He's called the son of encouragement. So that seems to be an area where he operates well. But then he's not one of the deacons. So probably, as far as we know, that wasn't one of his gifts because the Holy Spirit doesn't make any mistakes. But he's called the son of encouragement. And I want us to think about that for just a minute. We see already in the beginning one of the ways that he encourages others. When you and I are able from what we have to meet the needs of other people in the church, that is an encouragement. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you have never known the joy of giving, if you have never listened to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to give something or to help or to take out to eat somebody who perhaps wouldn't be going out to eat otherwise. If you have never experienced that, I want to tell you something this morning. You are missing the blessing of the Lord and the joy of the Lord. I had the privilege of many, many years living with someone who is one of the most generous people I know, Betty Wyndham. One of the most generous people I know. And those of you who've gotten to know her know that Betty, one of the things that she loved to do was just spread her money around. Not throw it around. <laughs> Not, that sounds bad, doesn't it? Not like a fat cat that's really, really rich and does this. Many times, Betty's, I can talk about it because she's not here now, right? <laughs> now, I, I, she, may, she, she may look at the, the message, but that's okay. She's not here to say shh or whatever. And I'm not doing this to praise, to, to put a person on a pedestal, but to talk about the blessing of giving. The, one of the greatest joys she had was being able just to share, and she often would do it quietly. She would often put it in an envelope. Nobody would ever know it came from Betty. They never would. Or she'd say, well, I'd like to do this, or I'd like to do that. And I had the blessing of living with somebody who was very, very generous. And it's something that I've enjoyed as well, but I think it's one of the gifts that she has. It really is. You know, when she came to Hong Kong, she, she had a good income as a teacher, and she, I can tell you something that she wouldn't tell you, but one of the things that she asked the Lord for with her job was this, Lord, I want to have enough so that I can bless other people. That was her prayer. Not so that I can have a big account, not so that I can do this for myself, but so that I can bless other people. And God used her in that way. And God has used and is using many of you in that way as well. But I want to tell you something this morning. You do not have to have a special gift from God. You do not have to have a special gift from God to be used in the ministry of encouragement through giving to other people's needs. You don't, have, you don't have to have a special call from God. All you have to do is, be, is have an open heart and open eyes to look around you and listen to the Holy Spirit. I promise you this morning, if you will ask, if, if you will ask God in these next two weeks, I challenge you. Ready? Here's a challenge. Within these next two weeks, you pray and you say, God, I'd like to experience that. I don't know that. And I'm, it can be something very small. It may be finances. It may be a meal. It may be something. It may be something. If you will ask God, I promise you this, He will direct you to give or to do, to encourage in giving. And you, what will happen is this. You will meet the needs of somebody else and you will be blessed. I guarantee it. I promise you that. And we see in Barnabas someone who had the 
the gift of giving, but beyond that, blessed others and encouraged them through giving. Do you remember when Big Steve gave his testimony a few years ago? One of the things he talked about was the, the time when he had no money. And you look at Steve now and you say, well, he's got a, a place here in Hong Kong and they've got a home in the Philippines and they're doing very well. He drives a nice car. And that's true. But there was a time before Steve got married when he did not have enough money to eat. And he's a diabetic. And you remember the story? All he had left in his house was some sugar. <laughs> not the best thing for a diabetic. And he didn't tell anyone. Nobody knew. And nobody would have guessed because he still dressed nicely when he came to church. Nobody ever would have known. And he was down to sugar. That's all he had. And he was preparing to eat sugar. And somebody gave him an amount of money that exactly, perfectly met his need at just the right time. I know who did it. But I'm not telling. <laughs> Pastors know all sorts of things, but I know who did it. And, and later on, because I knew this side, I knew the person who was giving, and I knew the person who was receiving. And on the side of the person who was giving, they had felt this was from the Lord. On the side of the need, on Steve's side, I had no idea. So when the person said something about it, I had no idea there was a need. But the person said, I, I feel that I should. I feel that I should. I said, do it. Give it. And, and it wasn't Sister Betty either, by the way. <laughs> it wasn't Sister Betty. And then to hear later on that it was exactly at the right time, exactly at the right need. What a blessing. Do you see the blessing? What a blessing for Steve. What a blessing for the person who gave. You don't want to miss out on the blessing of giving. It is a great encouragement to you and to the person. Amen? Amen. And so Barnabas, back to Barnabas. But as we go through the life of Barnabas, I'm talking about, I want us to look at some of the things that, uh, that, that by how he encourages people. The church continues to grow. Seven men are chosen as deacons of the church. Barnabas is not one of them. Stephen is martyred. A wave of persecution rises. Most of the believers, except for the apostles in Jerusalem, they are scattered abroad. And then... In these intervening chapters, we meet Saul, the great persecutor of the church, the one who is later to become Paul. And then Saul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he and the church are forever changed. Saul immediately begins preaching Jesus to everyone. I encourage you sometime to read about the life of Paul. As I was, I've been reading a lot in Acts these last few weeks, and I've been praying about some of the messages from the book of Acts. But I love to read about Paul because if you follow the life of Paul, you will find this, this guy, I, I, he was full of the Holy Spirit, and so I think that was part of it. I think he was so full of God that it really stirred up a lot of opposition. I think that's part about it, part of it. But if you read about the life of Paul, you know what you'll see almost everywhere, again and again and again. He preaches and preaches and preaches, and then they try to kill him. And he goes away to another city. And he preaches and preaches and preaches, and then they try to kill him, and he goes away to another city. And he preaches and preaches and preaches, and then they almost kill him, and God raises him up, and then he goes to another city. And we see that. And Saul immediately begins preaching Jesus. He's in the city of Damascus, and there's a plot to kill him. And when the believers in Damascus find out about it, they say, no, we, we have to protect our brother Saul, Paul. And so in the middle of the night, very dramatic, this is one of my favorite stories as a child, they get a basket. You know, this is a great Sunday school story. It really, really is. And they lower him in a basket through the window in the middle of the night because his enemies are at the gate waiting to see if he goes in or out of the city. And they send him off to Jerusalem. Now, five chapters later, Acts chapter 9, 926. He goes off to Jerusalem, and when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. Now, before we judge them too harshly, remember that this is before the time of telephones. This is before the time of internet. This is before the time of any newspapers. 
There's no way, really, they could know that Saul really, really was born again. And so they're afraid, and rightly so. Because the last time Saul was in Jerusalem, do you remember what he had done? He had presided at the at the stoning of Stephen and then had started persecuting the church. That's what they knew of Saul. That's all they knew of Saul. So even when he came and he said, I'm a believer now, they didn't believe. And we can't blame them, can we? We can't blame them because Saul, there, there was, I'm sure they thought this is some sort of trick and he's going to expose us. If we accept him, he's going to come into our midst and then we're all going to be arrested. We're all going to be dragged off to prison and we'll all be put to death for being Christians because that's what had happened to many, many others. And so they were afraid to meet him. And it is in these circumstances that we again meet the son of encouragement, Barnabas. What comes next? Acts 9, 27. 28. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles. Now stop right there before we go any further. Do you know what this means? This means that Barnabas must have gone to Saul. Must have, because nobody would meet with him. Barnabas took a step of faith, took a risk, his reputation and his life, and he went to Saul. And what does it say? Then he brought him to the apostles, and he told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus, and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. Now how does, Saul, how does Barnabas know that? Barnabas has to know that because he took time with Saul. He had to be with him. He had to spend time with him to find out what's going on in your life, Brother Saul. What has happened? What changed you from a persecutor of the church to a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ? What's going on in your life? It takes an encourager to do something like that. It takes an encourager. And Barnabas was just the person to do it. Now this tells us something else that the Bible doesn't say explicitly, but what this tells me is also this. Barnabas had to have a really good reputation and a, right, and a very good standing with the apostles to be able to go to them and say, he's now a Christian, we should accept him, and for the apostles to listen and agree. So the apostles accepted Saul, not on Saul's testimony, but on whose testimony? the testimony of Barnabas. And here we have the heart of an encourager. The heart of an encourager. There are people and we're around them and maybe sometimes we're the same way who look at others and who think always the worst. Who look at others and say, yes, but they didn't do this right. And look at others and they say, yes, but you can't be sure about that person. And it's true that we have to use wisdom in the church of God. But wouldn't you rather be a Barnabas who looks at people and says, there's hope for this one. I believe this one. Let's give him a chance. Let's try. I believe he's changed. I believe she's different. Let's bring her. Let's show her Christian love. Let's bring her in to the family of God. An encourager will look at others and will see the best. An encourager will look at others and say, there's hope. An encourager will look at others and will say, I'm going to trust you. Do you want to encourage other people? Give them some trust. Give them some trust. Say, I'm going to trust you with this. Put some confidence in them. Say, here, I'm going to, I'm going to stand with you on this. I'm going to agree with you on this. If you want to encourage people, that's something you can do that is easy to do. It's easy to do. Put some faith in other people. Put some encouragement in other, put some, put some trust and faith and belief in other people. And you may say, yes, yes, but they may let me down. Yes, they may. They may. But if you never give them a chance, I believe if Barnabas had not stepped out and given Saul a, chan a chance, we would not read about Saul, Paul today. 
I don't believe it. The church would not have accepted him. But Barnabas took who he was and his heart and he said, let's bring Brother Saul into our midst. He is a brother. Let's encourage him. And what do we read because of that? Verse 28, So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. An encourager will put faith and will put trust in other people. Now, let me talk about his name for just a little bit, and then we're going to go on with his life. We saw early on that Barnabas was given his nickname by the apostles. Think about Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Now, I want to ask you something as you think about Barnabas. Are you ready? This is the question for you and for me. In the church, the people around you that know you the best and that know you well, if they were to give you a nickname, think about it, what nickname could they give you? Seriously, think about it for just a minute. The grumbler. <laughs> I'm afraid some of, us, some of us might have that nickname, right? Bar, bar grumbler, because bar means son of, right? Bar grumbler. Bar whiner. Bar... What, Lolita's laughing back there. What, Lolita? Thunder? Oh, well, James and John were the sons of thunder, right? Would we have that nickname? nickname? Or would we have the same name as Barnabas? An encourager? Or someone who's a giver? Or someone who's a teacher? Or someone who loves others? Or someone who is gentle? Or someone who is kind? Or someone who is a hard worker? Or, I know there's a smell, don't worry. Oh, let me encourage you right now. Do you smell that smell? Yes. It, let me encourage you, it will not kill you. It will not harm you. It will not make you sick. I promise you. Who did it? Mariage, we don't know. It's, it's from somewhere in the building. So encourage one another. That does, that does smell true. We don't know where. It's air con or whatever. We don't know. We don't know. So are you encouraged? It's not going to kill you? Okay, we've opened, the, we've opened the doors a little bit. I know, it is a, I know there is a smell. You can encourage one another. Yeah, be sure you translate that, May. The, the smell won't. We, we don't know what it is. <laughs> okay. Aren't you glad that we live at a time like this? What if you had lived 2,000 years ago? Imagine the smells at that time. The smells were really, really awful then when there was open sewage in the streets and things like that. Now, let's go on with the name of Barnabas. Son of was often used in Hebrew or Aramaic, and it indicated a person's character or nature. And so what we know is this. Barnabas not only did one good deed, but Barnabas had the character of an encourager. Barnabas had the nature of an encourager. That was what he was. He was an encourager. Now, here's something else that's wonderful about his name. His name in Greek is this. Are you ready for it? Periclesis. Oh, wow. What does that sound like? That sounds like the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? What was the name of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gave in the, in the Gospel of John? The Holy Spirit was called the paraclete. The paraclete. One who comes along beside, who comforts, who strengthens, who teaches, who what? Encourages. Encourages. That was the name and the title of the Holy Spirit. I know there's distraction. Y'all keep your focus this way. There's a lot of distraction this morning, so it's, we know it's not the Lord. So the name of Barnabas is paraclesis, and it means to exhort or to encourage. And it's related to the word paraclete, which was the name of the Holy Spirit. So he's a son of encouragement or comfort or exhortation. What a blessing Barnabas was to the church. 
when someone encourages, like Barnabas does, he or she is doing the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the comforter. The Holy Spirit, the encourager. The Holy Spirit who comes into our hearts and works in our lives when we are discouraged, when we have lost hope. And the Holy Spirit lives in us and dwells in us and strengthens us and reminds us God loves you. And the Holy Spirit lives and dwells in our hearts and lets us know you are born of God. When the enemy comes and when the enemy attacks and says you're worthless, how can God love you? You've blown it. You failed again. The work of the Holy Spirit in in your heart and in my heart is to remind us of the love of God that we can ne that can never be separated from us it can never be taken away from us the love of God in our hearts is working and is loving and keeping us and reminding us that God is our Father and that Jesus loves us and that we're not our, on our own and that He is praying for us and that He is with us that's the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the encourager is similar to that. When you and I practice encouragement, when you and I encourage others, brothers and sisters in the family of God, we are doing the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. So there you have this name, the Holy Spirit, Paraclete. Barnabas's name in Greek, Paraclesis. And the two are related. It's, this, it's going along the same lines. And now what happens? Let's go just a little bit further this morning. Ba Saul is in Jerusalem, and as I said earlier, he preaches so mightily that opposition is stirred up, and they try to kill him again. And he's arguing with people, not arguing. Sometimes people want to kill us for the wrong reasons, right? You know when somebody's so frustrated with you, I could just... I don't mean that. I mean having so much of Jesus in your heart and life that the enemy opposes you. And that's what was happening in Saul's life, in Paul's life. And so there's a, there's a murder plot, and the Christians send Saul away back to his hometown. And Barnabas disappears again. The spotlight shines on Peter now. There's, where's Paul? Paul has gone off to his hometown of Tarsus. Where's Barnabas? Barnabas is in the church in Jerusalem, and great miracles occur People begin to share the gospel. They begin, they begin to go out through Asia and through Europe. And then they go as far as the city of Antioch. And in Antioch, which was the third largest, the third most important city in the whole Roman Empire, this is what happens. Acts 11.21. They begin to preach all of these, not the, disciples, not the apostles, but just ordinary Christians, just like you, just like you, just like me. They begin to go and they begin to travel, and the Holy Spirit is with them, and this is what happens. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. What happens was exactly what Jesus said would happen. Acts 1.8 You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is poured upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and keep on going, the uttermost parts of the earth. What Jesus says will happen, happened. And the power of the Lord is with them and many began to turn to the Lord the church in Jerusalem hears about it, and what do they do? Acts 11.22 When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they did what? They sent Barnabas to Antioch. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. If there are new believers in the church, do you know who they need around them? Do you know who they need speaking into their lives? Do you know who they need calling them the day after they've gotten saved and they're at, in their home and they're working? Do you know who they need to say, hey, let's go out and eat together? They need Barnabas. They need Barnabas. And it's not just a work for the evangelism team. It's not primarily a work for the pastors. 
The work of Barnabas is the work that every one of us, you and I, every one of us should be doing in this church. As people come to the Lord, as there are new believers in the church, they need a Barnabas. And you and I can be a Barnabas as well. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. Why do they send Barnabas to Antioch? Because he's an encourager. He's an encourager. That's why they sent him. Was it because he was so well educated? No. It was because he was an encourager. Was it because he was from Cyprus and some of these people were from Cyprus? No. It was because he was an encourager. Was it because he was quite wealthy? He probably was because he had lands to sell. No. It was because he was an encourager. And in the church of God, there must be encouragers. Every single one of us is called to be a Barnabas. Every single one of us, we are called to be a Barnabas. Look at verses 23 and 24, and then we'll stop here for today. And we'll pick it up again next week. When he arrived and he saw this evidence of God's blessing, here's the heart of the encourager, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers. Oh, he did what? He encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. That's the work of an encourager. That's the work of an encourager. And you say, well, I, I don't know if that, I, that's not me. It can be. It can be. Start small. Start small if you haven't encouraged others before. If you haven't done this type of thing. If you haven't worked in this area. If you haven't exercised gifts in this area before. Do something. Ask the Holy Spirit to, God, God Holy Spirit, make me a Barnabas. I would love it if every one of us had the nickname Barnabas. I really would. Because when we have Barnabases operating in the church, guess what will happen? People will be brought to the Lord. The church will be established and God's name will be glorified. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to stop here for today. And we will pick up next week. There's more in the life of Barnabas. Lord willing, we will get the aircon figured out by then. And I will try to preach.